broadcast with gigantic pipe organs shortly with symbols. Hold it. Shh, shh. Any minute now, it's liable to happen. Do you notice the manic intensity that's beginning to develop? 27 states are clinging to this tiny little island of Manhattan. 27 states. Iowa wishes to devil it was here. Do you know how it feels to live in Ohio? Just knowing that there is a New York? Yes. No wonder they hate us. No wonder they walk around town and take pictures to show them back home how it could be if Columbus would only grow up. Hold on. Shh, 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 shh. May I please have a symbolic giggle from a chick? <laughs> Beautifully done. There's, <laughs> there's a pregnant pause down here in the limelight. Well, there's more than a pregnant pause. <laughs> We're here in the steaming, fetid jungle of New York's Greenwich Village. A veritable human cake of Fleischmann's yeast. <laughs> bubbling and hissing and steaming. The search for truth goes on. And beauty. And simplicity of existence. Right, friends? All set? One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> no. Can you imagine some guy walking down 14th Street <laughs> and out of the blue, suddenly he hears, ah, ah, ah. he says, another demonstration. <laughs> and in a nutty way, it is, you know. Speaking of demonstrations, since we are on the air now until midnight, coming to you from the limelight in Greenwich Village, I'm going to give you a warning. This is going to not be for women and children. You know that? I said women and children. Look at the whole audience is left. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Secretly. Let's, let's face it. Outside tonight, stalking the streets, is the pure animal sizzling, hungry, rushing lust of the first true summer night. It was 94 degrees today. And what does that do to us? Don't you feel it inside of you? Out there in those streets, just on the other side of Sheridan Square, all around there's this great surging mass of humanity walking back and forth and the moon is hanging up above us. It's all there ready. Yes, friends. I want you to put your hands on that radio. Put your, come on, come on forward, friends. Put your hands on that radio. Do you feel that warmth the surging up through those knuckle bones? Do you feel it surging up through those, through those wrist bones and up into your elbow bones and going fine into your heart? <laughs> you feel that? Yes, that's the sound and the feel of solid electronic passion coming your way out of this human cake of yeast. Do you know, you know, speaking of the human cake of yeast, not more than two hours ago, I am riding on the IRT. Boy, I'll tell you, that's where it's really being lived. I'm serious, you know, what, what bothers me is how many people write plays and books and they live up in Maine and Vermont, they live in islands off the Greek coast, and they're writing about life in America. Oh yeah, more than one, more than one young writer believes that if he gets the Corsica, the truth is going to come out. His talent will flower. 
Whereas, as a matter of fact, I would only recommend to every visitor to New York, ride the IRT. Go to Katz's, maybe knock down a Nathan hot dog at the other end of the line, and stand there and hang on to those bars in the IRT car and read those car cards. And look at that crowd sitting there steaming hot, fat ladies with Bloomingdale shopping bags. Just sitting there, you know, salami sticking out. And guys cruising up and down the cars. Have you seen that new thing of the guys cruising the cars for, for, for interesting looking chicks? You know, they're cruising. Walking. Now, what did you think those guys were doing going from car to car? They were looking for the... Did you think they were looking for the club car or what? You know, you know it is true, you know. You just accept these guys walk and they look back and then they boom with the car. Well, let me tell you, I am on the IRT not more than about two hours ago, coming down to the village. And boy, it's hot. You know, it's really hot down there. They, they have not yet really air-conditioned the subway. <laughs> well, the air is conditioned, but, it's, uh, you know, you get the sense of old Neats foot oil and old footballs and, you know, gyms and locker rooms and all kinds of stuff. And it's life, you know, it's really life. Isn't, have you noticed that, that we devote most of our time here in America to expunging all the the tracks we leave expunging in fact the traces that we leave of life itself what do you think the air conditioning system is for you know you can buy an air conditioning system now that blows vermont air you're living on third avenue you know and in comes vermont well i know certain places in vermont that if they blew that air in it would curl your hair but they blow Vermont air, or they have one, you can set it for lake. You can set it for ocean, or stockyards. <laughs> or, yeah, I'll tell you the truth, you can set it for anything, you know, pine trees, you can set it for an uh, interesting house on a street in New Orleans. Uh, <laughs> it's cheap perfume, you know, all kinds of stuff. You know, pianos playing, and guys yelling and hollering, cigar butts smell. Well, we do this, you know, we're devoting ourselves to getting rid of it, but sadly enough, the very thing that makes life wild and swinging is the very thing that most of us want to get rid of. And I'm standing in the IRT, and I'm digging the scene, really, I'm just, it, it's just so exciting on a hot night, because everybody becomes very, how shall I say it, very uh, basic, really basic. Guys' shirts are open, you know, sitting there. You can see their hair sticking out all over from their chest. Women, you know, they've given up all the, all the jazz. You know, the women, after, after five and a half hours at Bloomingdale's, it's all sweated down and everything, sitting there sweating. And everybody is truly a human being. And I'm, I'm, I'm standing there in the subway. It's packed. Oh, boy, you can't get a seat. I'm hanging there. And who am I looking right in the eye? Miss Subway. You know, Miss Subway up there on that card, you know, it says, Miss Subway for July. And she's got this beautiful, clean, non-Subway look. She looks like she never rode a Subway in her life. It says, Miss Subway, Miss Subway this month works in a very thrilling electronic supply office. She is the epitome of the chic New York secretary who combines efficiency with chicness. And there she is looking out. It says, after she has left work, she uses her spare time by painting and making ceramic ashtrays. Wouldn't you love to know that, chick? <laughs> it says, she is also interested in freelance modeling. Well, I'm standing there, you know, and I'm looking at this subway chick, and I'm looking at the real chicks around me, the real subway chicks, with the leopard skin leotards and all that, you know. And I can't imagine one of them making a ceramic ashtray. But watching Miss Subway, reading them, have you, are you a Miss Subway fan? I, I myself am, and I'm not putting her down. She's, I really, I love people who have beautifully ordered lives like that. Now that's an ordered life. 
Now, if I were to come up to you and say, what do you do with your spare time, son? Well, I weave baskets. <laughs> you know? You know? That's the kind of life everyone wants to lead. You know, that kind of thing. Everything is clean up. What do you do, son? Well, I am interested in good literature. And you can see the guy sitting there at home reading Conrad. <laughs> you know, somehow the idea of Miss Subway. Miss Subway you're talking about. You know, the IRT? <laughs> Miss Subway at home doing ceramics. It kind of, you know, it kind of, you want to say, Miss Subway, come with me. Please, come fly with me, Miss Subway, to Nathan's. <laughs> we will have a hot dog. I will get you away from those rotten, sterile ceramics. Come with me to 7th Avenue where we will walk at 2 o'clock in the morning under the moon. We will look in rotten pawn shops. We will go past alleys where funny things are going on. And you can use it as a motif for an interesting ceramic ashtray. <laughs> Got to use life. Speaking of using life, oh no, we're not there yet. Hold on. Yes, life is hard. Life is for all. Oh, by the way, before we go any further, this week has been designated as National Entertainment Week. It is. It is National Entertainment Week, and the other day I'm listening to the radio. I'm listening to a Met Ball game. Oh, yeah, now don't put it down. This is not about baseball, honey, because baseball isn't about baseball. It's about life. You're going to learn that one day. You really are. I am listening to a Met Ball game when suddenly Lindsay Nelson, who is usually the most humorless of all announcers, Lindsay Nelson says, hey, Ralph, he's talking to Ralph Kiner, who is a home run belter of fantastic proportions. He says, hey, Ralph, and it's on radio. You see, you don't see Ralph, you don't see Lindsay, nothing. You just hear him, see, which is which, what makes radio great. He says, hey, Ralph, and you hear, huh? He caught him. Uh, he caught him unawares. You know, Ralph was down there picking the scores. And he says, "Hey, Ralph." He says, "It's National Pickle Week, Ralph." And in the middle of that, you hear a big yell. The Mets of you know somebody scored eight runs on the Mets. And he says, "It's National Pickle Week, Ralph." And <laughs> Ralph says, "Yes." <laughs> and, and, and he says, "He says, are you going to go out and get yourself a big fat pickle this week?" And Ralph says, well, I guess so. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the ridiculousness of it all came out to me. You know, right out of that little crummy busted Crosley, in the middle of a ball game at 2 o'clock in the morning, they're playing the Dodgers, you know, and it's way out on the coast somewhere. And I, I'm listening to this game, and it's National Pickle Week. And Ralph Kiner, a great home run hitter, is going to celebrate by getting himself a big kosher dill. Well, well, you know, this is National Entertainment Week. No, seriously, it really is. And the proclamation says that entertainment is a very important part of American life. And not only is it an important part, it's an integral part of the life of peoples everywhere. Whenever they use the word peoples in a proclamation, stand back. It's a drippy one. It says peoples everywhere love entertainment and it makes life worth living. So go out and celebrate National Entertainment Week next week. Well, I read that thing. You know, and I'm thinking about this. Have you ever really thought about entertainment? What is it? I mean, seriously, what is it? Everyone just accepts it, you know, for absolute kind of on total entertainment. What is entertainment? What do we need? Why do we need it? I mean, entertainment can be a guy jumping up and down. He's dancing, you know. He's dancing away there, and everybody's cheering. They go home. Well, he does it better than I do. But all he's doing is jumping up and down. You know, jumps up and down, everybody goes there, and it's the ballet. You know, either that or it's a chick standing on one foot. The music plays. And have you thought about music? No, seriously. I'm, I'm, this, is a, this is a very... No one has been ever, ever to define entertainment. You know, a war can be entertainment. Oh, yeah. 
Many a guy is entertained at the most peak when his knee starts to hurt. And he develops an interesting limp. He's entertained, you know. He's entertained. He loves it. Entertainment can be reading about other people's lives. Why do we have to do this? Have you seen that gigantic sign on 42nd Street? Big sign. Tremendous, and I don't know whether you know anything about 42nd Street west of Broadway, between Broadway and 9th. Wow! I mean, talk, oh boy, talk about your rich mulligatawny stews. Well, there it is Army and Navy stores. They got used howitzers you can buy. They really have. Have you seen those? I, I stood there in front of a window one day and, and just stood for 10 minutes and looked at a used mortar. And it said, for sale, cheap, <laughs> in working condition. <laughs> and I could see myself going home, you know, setting it up in the backyard, <laughs> lobbing a few into the Bronx, <laughs> just for kick, boom. <laughs> what fireworks? Well, this is 42nd Street. They've got, for those of you who don't live in New York and don't know, there's one place down there, they've got a big cork tree. It's about, oh, it's about 15 inches across, thick, stands about eight feet, and it's covered like a porcupine with gigantic toad stickers, all stuck in, shivs, knives, <laughs> and the sign says, throwing knives, <laughs> a generous selection, <laughs> and then underneath it, it said, money back guaranteed. <laughs> Can you imagine trying this thing and you find you're only getting in curves with it, you know? <laughs> you keep missing people, you take it back. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a real scary scene down there. Well, there is a sign that hangs over this whole place down there. Tremendous sign. And the sign says in huge block letters, Get more out of life. Go to a movie. <laughs> Get more out of life. Go to a movie. Watch somebody else do it. Go there and watch Geraldine Page cry when Anthony Perkins comes into the room. And I thought, get more out of life. Go to a movie. What a great, what a, what a slogan that is for 20th century living. Get more out of life. Get a 24-inch television set. You can see David Brinkley twice as big. <laughs> life, you know. This is fantastic. This is vicarious. You know, the whole concept of vicarious living. I wonder, you know, have, have you ever watched chicks? You, you see that they're far more influenced by this than men. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Watch them from the outside. Do you remember when we went through a cycle of, oh, there were millions of Bronx Marilyn Monroe's. You remember the Bronx Marilyn Monroe's? Then we, you don't remember that when all the chicks made with the Marilyn Monroe stuff? Then we went through a cycle of Elizabeth Taylor's <laughs> with the purple eyelids, you know? And now we are going through the most gigantic cycle of Barbara Streisand's. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, they're, they're all over the place, you see. Whereas men are not quite that affected by it. I don't know many men who consciously imitate, let's say, uh, Gary Cooper. You know, consciously they, they develop sunken cheeks and kind of friendly little, you know, the Gary Cooper sort of Jimmy Stewart look, you know, oh, gee, I don't know. You know, you know no, men, men just go along and sort of scratch. And, and as they do, the scenery around them changes. The scenery changes due to this world of entertainment. And so one day, a guy's with Marilyn Monroe. A couple of days, he's with Barbara Streisand. He notices the chick has gotten very aggressive. That's the Streisand shout, you know. And, and he notices that. And a couple of weeks later, it's Audrey Hepburn. Remember when they went through the Audrey Hepburn bit? Then there was the Jackie look for a while. I do not know many guys who are consciously going through the Rip Torn phase. You know, consciously. <laughs> well, maybe a few. I mean, you get out there. But this is, to me, very interesting. In fact, you know that, that there have been anthropologists 
and sociologists and people who, estheticians, people who deal in aesthetics, who've been trying to figure out what is meant by this thing, entertainment, art, beauty, this vicarious joy we get at seeing somebody, like say somebody walk on a tightrope. <laughs> And then we all cheer. Or somebody gets up and he's trained a cocker spaniel to jump through a hoop. We cheer. That's pretty fascinating. We're the only creature anywhere who we know of who demands entertainment. You know that? That's one of the things that sets man apart from all other creatures. We think dogs do. No. Dogs are not being entertained when they're chasing a ball and bringing it back. That's not the same thing. We demand a peculiar kind of thing, and it takes wild forms. I'm going to tell you a story about one night that I, I, I kind of came across almost what it's all about. And ever since that time, I've felt funny about going in movie houses. You know, have you ever gone in a movie house at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Times Square or some big center, and it's filled with all the cast-offs? <laughs> The, the guys that are out of work, the chicks that are God knows what, you know. And they're all sitting in there and they keep wide spaces between each other. They're kind of surrounded by their own shame, you know, they're sitting there. And they all sit and watch this double and triple feature. The longer the better, the longer the better. And on the screen, the sound of hoofs galloping. John Wayne is taking the Alamo. It's fantastic, they're watching. They sit there, and all the while they should be, they know it, they should be doing something else. They should be making their lives work. They should be working, or they should be writing the book, or they should be getting a job. And they just sit. And then suddenly, out in the open air, they come. You know that terrible feeling of coming out of a play, and the sky is up there, the sun is beaming down, and you have a vague feeling at first of being self-conscious out on the street. You know that funny feeling? And feeling as though somehow you've, you've been cheating. You know, even if it's a great movie, you feel, I've been cheating. It's a rotten feeling. It's funny. Well, when I was a kid, we had a show, a little theater. Just, it's, you know, just a neighborhood theater exactly like all neighborhood theaters called the Orpheum. Isn't that a great name? You know, <laughs> you know about Orpheus? <laughs> Somehow Orpheum, the Orpheum in Hammond, Indiana. The Orpheum. And there in the Orpheum, which was done in a kind of Greco-Moorish way, during long evenings, the entire neighborhood would go. They used to call it the neighborhood theater. And then they gradually stopped going. And then a new thing began to develop. Bingo. Kino. Bank night. And then finally dish night. <laughs> now, do you know what dish night is? You know, most of it, it, this is something that most of us have completely forgotten. But if you can imagine going down to the Paramount on Times Square and they give you a gravy dish when you go in, you know, they hand you a gravy dish so that the con you to come in and see Anthony Perkins. Well, that's what it was. They gave you a set of dishes. And everybody got all excited. They got all hung on this, you see. And they had out in the lobby a great big glass case. And in the glass case was the total set, the complete set of dishes that you could get. And they were these green crystal ones. You know the kind they give away in gas stations? <laughs> you know that kind of stuff. It's you know, I'll tell you, my mother still eats off of them, so... <laughs> and they're very important. She, she went through hours of hell to get them, you know. <laughs> you know, I would say, it's like green stamps. You know, people will, will fight for their green stamps more than their money. You can steal my dough, steal my everything, steal my husband, kill my kids, but take my plaid stamps, no. Because it, it represents something important. Well, the old manager of the Orpheum decided since things were going bad, that he better give away dishes. And he got these green dishes. You could see through them. You hold them up, you know, they're dark green. 
And everyone thought, isn't that beautiful? It's a kind of slob art, you know? <laughs> it, it really is. No, I, I think we should, we, should, we should recognize this art form. I mean, like plastic orchids. Uh, Oh, yeah, that's a slob art form. Uh, you know those big gold bas-reliefs of African natives hitting drums? You know, that you see up in the Bronx in these Chinese modern uh, furniture stores. The whole concept of Chinese modern is slob art, as far as I'm concerned. I know a guy who had a, who had a cafe model, a Chinese, ancient Chinese TV set. And... Yeah, it had, it, had, it had teak wood, you know, little red dragons, a little, a little bamboo things. And this is true slob art. It's, it's combining a kind of non-function with non-function. Well, well these, green, <laughs> these green dishes, I remember well, they had molded grapes on them. You know, little raised places, you see, that would, with all the, all the like, like all the mashed potatoes would gather in there. And... <laughs> Well, they looked awful with food on them, I'll tell you. If you've ever eaten red cabbage on green dishes, it's wild. With meatloaf, you know, real, real family house food. Well, they started to give these things away, and every Wednesday night, the concept was, if you came every Wednesday on dish night, which was the night after bank night, and the night before bingo night, if you could, nobody talked about the pictures anymore. <laughs> I just came, see, front of stairs up there dancing, and all you could hear is the rattle of dishes in the audience. <laughs> well, well, it's a funny thing. They used to, they, they would, they would, this is exactly the way it would work. When you'd come in, I remember it well, you'd walk in, and you know where the guy takes the ticket and he tears it? Well, he used to have a great big cardboard thing there, just filled right to the top with saucers or cups. They squeezed it out. You know, you got a saucer and a cup separately. Those were two separate nights. Boy, that was a bad night when you got a saucer night. You know, a little thing, you walk in. Well, you'd come in, he'd tear your ticket, and he would only give it to adults. And he would say, oh, yes, yes, uh, saucer. Saucer night tonight. And he'd hand my mother the saucer, and she'd take the saucer, and we would walk into the darkness. It was not air conditioned. It was dark and hot, and it was summertime. And up on the screen would be Fred Astaire or Ginger Rogers, some never, never land up there. Priscilla Lane, guys like Jeffrey Lynn had no relationship to the steel mills, none whatsoever. They're up there and they're doing things. Jeffrey Lynn is always coming in with a tennis racket. Walk in, you know, tennis, nobody, tennis in our name, pool rooms, you know, we played. Well, this, this was the kind of strange... I can only say it was surrealistic. Out of this background, by the way, comes humorous and starkly realistic writers. Out of this background comes people like Theodore Dreiser, people like uh, Farrell. It has to be, you see. Because what are you going to do if, if, for example, if, if you see a, a movie with, let's say, Priscilla Lane, you know how she looked. She always, great, you know, she just came out there, she always looked like she was just out of a shower. She was thin. She had all these sisters. And Faye Bainter was always her mother. And there was always Jeffrey Lynn coming over. And he was always an author. And he played tennis. Well, if you show that in Cape Cod, that's the way it is. They don't see any difference, you know. They don't see any nuttiness in life from that. You show it in Brooklyn. They think that's the way it is in Brooklyn. They really do. Every, every last Brooklyn kid I know wants to make it big as a writer and become a tennis player. Oh yeah, Moss Hart, that whole syndrome, it's all there. Well, guys out in the steel mill don't have that idea. They don't. I don't know one guy in the steel mill district who says, I'm going to write the play. I'm going to write the play for Mary Martin. And, and she's going to come out there, she's going to have this big hat with fruit on the top. And we're going to call it uh, South Whoopie. And she's going to she's gonna do this thing, and Razzano Brazzi's going to... He doesn't think of doing this. He doesn't. But what do you think he thinks when he sees it? Does he think it's life? I don't know. It's very hard, because I sat out there and watched Priscilla Lane and the guy with the tennis racket. I watched... No, oh, you know, Robert Cummings with this phony English accent. 
I, he was not like anybody on the South Side. Not one of us. Well, here is, for that reason, the Midwest develops a fantastic anti-showbiz attitude, which is generally called square. Yeah, so Mary Martin comes out to Chicago and lays an egg. Why? They're sitting out there and she makes no sense to them. She's up there dancing and they're singing and the tennis rackets are out. It means nothing to the blast furnace crew. Well, <laughs> so I'm sitting in this theater, you see, and this, this began to build up. And they had to lure the people into the theater. They literally had to drag them right in. And so they're giving them dishes. This is life. This is life. You eat your salami on a dish. You eat your red cabbage on a, your kohlrabi. Do they have kohlrabi out here? Did you ever eat turnips? <laughs> I mean, you know, have you ever had turnip patties? That's a big Midwestern bit. You take, you take mashed patties, turnips, from yesterday. <laughs> it has to be yesterday's turnips. You mash them, and then you fry them. And after you fry them, you put gravy on them. They're terrible. <laughs> Uh, but what is this a pro turnip crowd here what is it <laughs> so so anyway it's that kind of life and when it gets hot out there everything changes very definitely you do not see Bermuda shorts in the blast branch not the, none of this everybody just sweats more and wears the same stuff <laughs> They really do. You know, you see guys with dark suits and they leave a puddle all drag them out. Just walking down the streets. And, oh, yeah, they sweat and their collars turn up and they sit there. Well, everybody would go to this theater every Wednesday night and there would be big excitement. He would keep it back. He would not tell you what next week was going to be, whether it was going to be a soup bowl night or, you know, next. He would, he would save it for a surprise. Also, he knew that there were certain things people wouldn't come for. See, he, you know, you got enough saucers. You don't want no more saucers. You know, it's a glass night. Everybody drank out of jelly glasses. You know, so glasses didn't bring them in. There were certain things like platter night. Millions of ladies would come. You see, it was a platter night. Well, every Wednesday night, me, my kid brother, my mother, and my father. See, they tried to get two sets. They were getting a set together for Aunt Teresa. <laughs> it was for Christmas, you know. And my father would get Aunt Teresa's set, and my mother would get our set. So we'd come in there every Wednesday night, and there would be the box. And the first couple of nights, he had big things, like platter. Great big platter, you know. And the word got out in the neighborhood, this fantastic platter. We got three, you know, big thing. So everybody is sitting in the theater there, and up on the screen is Priscilla Lane. And about every 10 minutes, you'd hear, crash! <laughs> and then you'd hear this muffled swearing. And, and then the two people would get up and leave the theater. Like, What's the use of staying through the tennis pit, you know? And, you know? The whole reason for the evening was shot, you know? <laughs> Gee, you know, all week we waited and you dropped it. Oh. What are we going to do now? No platter. They're not going to have another whole set of dishes, no platter. What are we going to do? Well, you know, it was there, and it was a point of no return, you know. They didn't repeat these nights, you see. If you messed up, boy, on the gravy dish, forget it, you know. There was... So they, they, they got you hung like that, see. So every night they would come down and they'd give these dishes. Well, it got to be really, you know, it's like dope or something. You really get hung on it. And so after about 13 or 15 or 20 consecutive weeks, you've got a pile of them. You know, there's a, eight cups are over here, and you've got a couple of dishes, you've got a saucer and a soup plate, and it's beginning to build. And as it built, people got more manic. Let me tell you, a guy with one or two plaid stamps in his book is not a dangerous man. <laughs> Give him 15 pages filled up and you have a suspicious man that'll shoot on sight. <laughs> oh yeah, that's why guys, listen, that's why guys with a lot of dough, rich men are always more rotten about money than poor guys. It's like the guy with the filled up plaid stamp book. He gets really hung on keeping that book fat. You gotta have it real fat. You can't stick it in your pocket. You know, it's got to somehow, this, this, if you could get a wallet that was shaped like a bowling ball, 
because of all the stuff you got in it, you know, it's a great feeling. And you protect it. You really do. A guy with 15 cents in his pocket, he'll shoot it right away. 15 cents, give me an ice cream cone. He eats it, nothing. He's dead now. He's broke. He shot it off. You try to get Nelson Rockefeller to shoot it all, I'll tell you. And don't think the voters don't know it. You know, they sit out there. Uh, there's the Goldwater crew. Boy. Well, oh, speaking of, gold, speaking of Goldwater, what station is this? Come on, hit it! New York, the Big Apple. Right. We don't have dish night down here. Not in New York. <laughs> where they're hung on showbiz, you know. Well, I'm sitting there every night, you know, got to be a ritual, every Wednesday night, immediately after supper, we put away everything and run out down the street to the Orpheum. And there would be talk. I remember there would be talk at the dinner table. I wonder when they're going to start with the gravy dishes. <laughs> Somehow having a gravy dish is the epitome of... Well, it's civilization. <laughs> My mother used to just take the pan she made the meat in, you know, pour it over everybody. <laughs> Somehow having your, your gravy in a dish, you know, a little gravy boat, was a fantastic concept. Well, they would say, when are they going to get the gravy dishes? And someone would say, I, I think, I understand they're going to have a fruit dish. Fruit dish. Fruit dish, you know, what is a fruit dish? You know, a fruit dish, we just, you know, you get the apple out of the bag. Fruit dish. And there would be all this stuff, you know. Well, one night, after about 15 weeks of this, my mother had collected half a cupboard full, and all the tin cups, all the aluminum, little orphan Annie mugs were pushed in the back. She was establishing a nest. <laughs> we had all these things. And the week before, we had gone down there and had really hit a kind of interesting jackpot. We had gotten a dish the first time that we ever had a dish like this in the house. And we were using it night and day. People were using it just constantly. It was a butter dish. You know, with the little thing on the top? <laughs> you know how butter, you know, actually we never had, it was an oleo dish in our neighborhood. <laughs> uh, you know, I grew up eating oleo that was white. <laughs> it looked like lard, you know. They never, they never colored it, you know. It would come with a little pill or something you'd mix it. After a couple of tries at that, it would get sort of paisley colored with stripes. <laughs> My mother gave that up. We, 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 we would eat white oleo, you know, oleo. So it would always be in a little pile on the, on the dish. Well, she would take our oleo after we got our butter dish and make it into a little square. Put the top on. It's butter. It's in a green dish. Well, we had gotten our butter dish. Everybody's gasped by it. Wednesday night come, we're all excited. The word is out, it's going to be gravy night. There's going to be a gravy boat tonight. We're going to complete the set. We go down there, we're standing in line. We get up there, he hands my mother a butter dish. <laughs> Two butter dishes. And he says, I'm sorry, but the, the dish that we were expecting to give tonight didn't come but we have extra butter dishes and we're giving out butter dishes tonight and next week when we have our, no, our other dishes you can come back and bring your butter dish back we'll exchange it so everybody's sitting in there there's a kind of silence that they all sit there everybody's got butter dish number two they're sitting there and up there on the screen is Jeffrey Lynn playing tennis with Priscilla Lane and the steel workers are all sitting there and you can smell the blast furnace dust and the sweat and it's hot, and there's a sort of a sort of suppressed anger. I don't know whether you know what a crowd from the sheet mill is like on Wednesday night with its second butter dish in its hand. This is a this is just right on the edge, you know. It's like a volcano. Everybody's sitting there, and you hear you know the waiting, and the, you hear the butter dish rattling and clanking, and there's a sound. The people are talking. They're not with the picture. The week goes by. Everybody arrives down there next Wednesday with its separate butter dish under its arm. My old man's got one. My mother's got one. And there is Mr. Forsythe, who operated our theater. He's standing back of his little ticket thing, and he's looking very embarrassed. 
be a saying, I'm very sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but there was a shipment mix-up that we got the shipment of dishes that were supposed to go to Minneapolis to the theater up there, and you're just going to have to accept this dish. Uh, you can exchange it next week. And he hands my mother a butter dish. <laughs> Now, it sounds like I'm making it up. I want to tell you that God's honest truth. This is exactly what happened. He goes, a butter dish. And you could hear these guys. Ooh. <laughs> and then you, once in a while, you, know, you ought to see a, a, an old Polish steel worker with two butter dishes in his hands. You know? And they, only, they don't even eat oleo in his house. It's lard, you know, on the bread. He's over there and he's saying, what, what's a butter dish? What about a dish? He walks in, okay, okay. One week goes by. We are now in the fourth week of our Lord. There's been a lot of talk in the number two open heart. Everybody is lined up, and what do you think he is handing out? Butter dishes. The crowd is sitting there now. Everybody in the crowd's got four butter dishes. They have brought them back to exchange. And somewhere, someplace in that rotten New York, they're sending this guy an endless stream of butter dishes. The Balaban and Katz Company are going to hear of this. Well, about halfway through the picture that night, it was a fantastically hot night. In the Midwest, when it's hot, you know like it was today? Multiply it by four. I'm serious. Because they don't have an ocean, you know. They don't have that ocean breeze. They have a humidity of 115. And everybody is sitting in the theater. Ooh, they're sitting there and you can just feel it growing. And up on the screen, Fred Astaire is dancing on the top of a piano. And he's wearing his high silk hat and he's got this cane, you know, and he's going back and forth and everything is looking good. And over on the right side of our screen is a sequined organ. You know the kind of organ that comes up after the picture and they say, follow the bouncing ball and sing red sails in the sunset. And this guy with the curly hair sitting there playing. Well, there it is up there to the right, this beautiful thing. When suddenly out of the darkness, you see arcing through that, you know, that, you just see it go right through a butter dish. It is in two pieces. It turns over, you know, and you see it outlined on the screen in shadow, you know. That butter dish, boom, up against that crash it goes on that, on that organ. And just like that, the crowd got the idea. Let me tell you, have you ever seen it rain butter dishes? You heard of it raining frogs? Butter dishes, there's a cloud of them like that. Little old ladies are throwing them. You know. and, and the lights go on and poor old Mr. Forsyth gets out there on the stage. You know, and it's, it's a sad, have you ever seen a movie house with the lights on? It's really sad, you know. I mean, it's, everybody's knee high in baby Ruth bars and kids have been sick on the floor. And, Big splotches and Cupid dolls are sort of half hanging off, gilt ones, you know. It's just, here's that crummy little red curtain up there. Mr. Forza says, excuse me, excuse me, please, excuse me, please. And from the back you hear this bohawk, shut up! <laughs> Boom! Well, old Forsyth, you know, was learning what showbiz is about. <laughs> And the butter dishes are hopping back and forth, they'll crash. And he says, excuse me, please. Next week, I have absolute authority to tell you it is a gravy boat week. Shut up! Gravy boat yourself! Boom! Well, the police arrived. And you know, it was a wild scene. They're taking all the steel workers out, and little old ladies, and we're knee deep in green glass. 
And, and I can't, you know, I, I can't imagine the explanation for the cops. Well, you see the butter dish night here, and the cops are all standing around, and little old ladies are being loaded into the wagon <laughs> with fire in their eye. Boy. Well, well, I, I want to tell you that that night became known as the butter dish riot. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and now stop it. Thank you. <laughs> well, it became known as the Butter Dish Riot, and weeks went by. It's funny how, how, how the crowd, you know, forgets. Weeks went by. Speaking of riots, look who's here. It's the Red Carter. Hey, let's go, men. Ho, 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 ho. Come on, let's go. This is the crew from the Red Garter. They got the hottest softball team in the business. And they're from one block down the street, and they're the wildest, angriest Dixie band in the business. Let's go, men. One, two, three, all together.
Carter. Uh, they're from right down the street. Let's give them a big song, man. Ho! 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 I want you to know they take their coffee break to come down here to play for you, so give them another cheer before they get out there. <laughs> and the Red Garter is just one block from us here, and we're at the limelight, a steaming, hot, fetid... <laughs> swinging bowl of mulligatawny stew and we'll be back in just five minutes after the news. Yeah. 